Welcome to another edition of Small Biz Matters, the program where you work on your small business education. And I'm very proud to have in a remote location, uh, something that some of my regular listeners will do, we know we do occasionally, is Matthew Addison, who is, of course, the head of ICB Australia, a very important um, institution for bookkeepers out there. And we're here to sing the praises of bookkeepers in, in the anticipation of Australian Bookkeeping Week, which of course is held in November. Thank you for joining us on the program today, Matthew. Thanks, Alexi, and ladies and gentlemen, greetings. <laughs> now, you've been involved in the bookkeeping industry for a number of years. Uh, why is it that you're so passionate about the role of a bookkeeper in basically in the role of a business? So, with the emergence of technology, with the ongoing changes to compliance and how hard it is to do business in Australia. Um, it is complex, it's complicated, and business people want to get on and do business. So how are they helped to meet their needs and meet their rec not just record keeping but their compliance needs? Um, to engage with experts who actually understand what the tax officer is trying to say, who understand what government's trying to say, and know how to apply it to business. So how do you run your business in a way that complies with law? Somebody needs to help that business person. Let's empower the business person to get on and make money doing what they want to do. And we as bookkeepers are that person that's passionate in the middle, uh, cares about the business and actually helps them comply and get on with, uh, with doing life. So bookkeepers I just see as an essential cog in the wheel of actually producing. And it's a different cog to the other um, advisors that they, a business, a good business person would surround themselves with because in my understanding, bookkeepers are there on the day-to-day -day level. They really understand at quite a granular uh, level how the business is operating and sometimes when it's making mistakes. Is that something you would agree with? Uh, yes, noting that the bookkeeping community is really broad. So, you know, I define bookkeeping that, that really does stretch to the lowest end of data entry processing through to some of the higher ends of business advice work. Um, I draw the line at income tax law. We put that out of scope, but, you know, GST and payroll and POIGW, uh, wine equalisation tax, they, they all fit in bookkeeper space or, or now with the Tax Agent Services Act, the BAS agent space. Um, so it's a very broad community and a very broad set of solutions. Why is it so important for not only bookkeepers but I guess for any uh, small business owner to become part of a professional association? Why do you think that's, a gay, I guess, a must in, in, in running a business? So I and, and we at ICB are very keen for the bookkeeper to be as professional as possible. And professional means understanding what you do understanding what your limits are, understanding what the law allows you to do, understand what the law prohibits you from doing. And what um, a number of us saw 20, 25, 30 years ago was that the uh, partners of software companies were starting to stretch the boundaries a little bit. Bookkeepers were starting to adopt software and what do I do now? How do I know whether I'm doing it right or not? So GST brought that to a head, but even prior to GST, um, how do we raise the level of the person that was helping business, the bookkeeper? How do we give them some benchmarks? How do we give them some standards and professionalism to lift the standard of bookkeeping in Australia and help them deliver a professional product really, really competently? So uh, that evolved into... Um, a group of us aligning with the Institute of Certified Bookkeepers who are based in the UK but a worldwide organisation. Uh, they were looking at Australia and going, hey, you've got software and you've got GST, do you need some help? At the same time as we were looking around going, how do we lift the level of bookkeepers? So the planets aligned and by adopting um, some of that worldwide professional organisation, we were able to start putting a footprint in Australia to say, bookkeepers are professional, mm. join up, have some standards, have a code of conduct, and now let's work with government on behalf of bookkeepers and their clients or their businesses to understand each other. Uh, and it just began to open doors. It opened doors with the software companies that are, are prolific in our space, and it opened doors into government, both at the um, 
government officials level, but also for ministers. Uh, it, it just opens doors by that professional. So we hear from government what they want and what they wish. We as an association are able to de-governmentalise that. We turn it into words that, that you know, yourself as a bookkeeper and other bookkeepers might understand. And our role is to make that implementable, so make it practical for you. Do you think that that's evolved into being, um, like you said, working with government are very much in an advocacy space? Is that is that a necessity for any professional association to really advocate for its members and to lift the profile? I mean, what to what extent is it all about PR a little bit? I wouldn't put it in the PR category. Um, representing the community and taking a voice into government, I think, is part of our role. So our 4,300 members um, seem to appreciate that they actually have a direct access uh, through ICB into the tax office, into fair work. And we can talk about whether that's an open door or not, but we at least talk to their door. Mm. Um, and, and other, you know, government agencies. So when there is a problem with a part of what the tax office is doing, if they're not getting... The answers through us, we represent the community to the government and we have represented it to ministers and ministers' roundtables to help set policy. Um, Tax Agent Services Act is under review at the moment, so Treasury are conducting a review. It's a multi-step process. A report will go to the minister um, just, uh, just prior to this uh, broadcast. There will be a, a report table to the minister. We represent bookkeepers to the Tax Agent Services Act review, to the future of what BAS agents will look like. Uh, we've run a number of consultations with our members. What is your view on the education of BAS agents, the education of bookkeepers? What's your view on the size of the stick that the Tax Practitioner Board has? So, yeah, there's an advocacy role, but it's representation or it's consultation, collaboration is the other part of the world. We as a bookkeeping community now get to collaborate with government. Mm. We get to consult with I was going to ask you that. Was there a time when it wasn't collaborative, when it was more, you know, bookkeepers were doing their own thing and they weren't really being consulted in the process, even though we were the ones with the finger on the pulse of the small business owner every day? Um, I, I think it has evolved a lot. So, um, I'm, I think the bookkeeping community was hidden um, 20 years ago, 25 years ago. Behind what? Um, they just weren't recognised mm. in the role that we did. Mm. So the accidental bookkeeper was a phrase that I used to use. You know, people became bookkeepers accidentally. They were the receptionist and they knew how to write numbers in a column or then they knew how to turn the computer on. So then software emerged and the receptionist became the accidental bookkeeper because they knew how to use software. So we were a, a bit of a hidden community, a bit of a we were there, uh, but we weren't formally recognised. Mm. Software and the implementation of desktop software and small business software, I think, began to give us a presence. So all of a sudden bookkeepers who, as you say, know how business works. We know the intricacies of how that business banks their money or receives their money or sends their invoices or receives invoices. So we're the ones there doing business, processing business. Software came along and gave us a profile because all of a sudden we could implement software and implement better business systems for, for clients. That raised our profile a little and... Through the software, we started having a voice to the implementation of GST is probably my favourite topic. Um, the software companies in Australia at the time, and in particular, um, I did some consulting through MIB to government about this is how business works, Mr ATO. This is what you're doing and this is the disruption you're going to cause to business process. So that, to me, was the real start of the bookkeepers and the bookkeeping process having a real impact on government's thinking. It was quite a clever decision by the software companies to align themselves with a group that ended up becoming, I guess, not only their, their own advocates but using their platforms and appreciating the fact that they were raising the profile of bookkeepers in the process, perhaps. 
Uh, and it's interesting watching the journeys of bookkeepers and software around the world. But but in Australia, the you know dominant software in the small business space all align with the professional associations. Uh, different sorts of relationships, and that ebbs and flows. Um, but yeah, I think the software see the value when the associations are being deliberate, being actionable, um, and representing the bookkeeping community. Mm. Let's talk about the role on an everyday level of the bookkeeper and um, your typical small business in Australia. Not that I can really say typical small business because there's definitely not a typical small business out there, despite the fact that government would like to think that we are either a cafe or a florist or um, a butcher. Uh, But let's talk about the role of the bookkeeper because we, uh, as you mentioned, you know, it began as sort of a, a data entry position and a compliance position. But now, because of the evolving nature of legislation, we're taking on more and more. Um, is that a good thing or a bad thing for the community? Uh, there's, a, there's a few levels to that that question, Alexi. The, um, where to start on that answer? I believe that the ecosystem that we work in, the business ecosystem, and in some cases I call it the tax ecosphere, we have government setting policy, we have the tax office um, administering the law that they're handed, and despite what the tax office sometimes say, the tax officer's role is to administer that law and collect tax. The taxpayer's role is supposedly to understand that law and pay the tax and lodge the forms. Now, there's a huge disconnect between those two bodies. We as bookkeepers are the intermediary that sits in the middle. So we understand, we go into business, we help them with their business process, we help them with their recording transactions, and we get to understand their business. We have a role to understand what government expects of them. So we are at the intermediary in the middle who understands what the law does and says this is how it applies to the cafe, this is how it applies to the florist, this is how GST applies to the frozen food versus the cooked food. You know, that, those sort of things is us understanding that the regs that the ATO put out there um, and government puts out there and applying it to each business. Uh, we take the business circumstances. Yes, we process the transactions or we check how, the recording of those transactions and we then help the business lodge the form in a true and correct nature that lodges the right do- data and therefore they pay the right amount of tax. So the role of the bookkeeper or the intermediary to me is really key. Mm. I, I, I think that the economy breaks down if you just had the regulator trying to talk direct to the taxpayer all the time. There's, as I started the, this interview with, I think business want to get on and do business. Mm-hmm. They want to sell flowers. Mm-hmm. They want to you know, barista coffee. They don't want to understand the difference on GST on these things. They want an expert to help them. And that's where I think bookkeepers sit in. And it's definitely where um, that's where the sweet spot is really because the businesses, as we know through statistics, the businesses that use bookkeepers and use BAS agents are more successful, are more profitable, are more likely to be more compliant. Does that keep the regulators happy? Uh, the Small Business Tax Performance Report has been released by the tax office where first time for a number of years they've actually done it for the small business sector and said how compliant are they, how much of the tax that they should be paying are they paying and key statistic that comes out of that is tax office, um, and I think I'll quote this stat the right way, tax office is saying they collect 95% of the tax that they believe they should get. So there's only 5% by quantity or value or 5% of taxpayers that really aren't complying. Now, if we align that with a few other stats, um, 78% of tax returns are lodged through agents. Um, The BAS agent space, we can't get a cold, hard statistic that proves how many bookkeepers and BAS agents are lodging BASs. Um, But it's got to be well in excess of 50%, and I'm taking that as a really conservative So if our tax compliance is as high as 95%, which is great, uh, and intermediaries, tax agents, BAS agents, you know, the accounts, tax agent space are known to be helping business, surely we fit in as a very valuable part of that that Mm. system. Um, 
And that recognition is is important, of course. Correct. Good to, good to see that the um, the tax office is running these sort of reports as well. Um, I wanted to ask you about a bit of a curly question, which is around the definition of small business. We're here at the Cosboa Conference and it seems to be something that is almost an elephant in the room. Um, do you think it's important that we have some sort of a definition across all sectors or all parts of the economy or all parts of legislation that actually define what a small business is? Or is that just sort of chasing our tail with, you know, semantics? On the positive side, if government recognise that a smaller business has less resources to respond to government requirements. So they go big business, $10 million and up or $50 million and up in turnover or 100 million, whatever that definition is. Big business, you have the resources. We expect a little more compliance. We expect a little bit more reaction from you. Um, Smaller business, whatever that definition might be, or the non-large business, Uh, we recognise you're less resourced. So we will give you this concession. We'll give you a little bit longer to lodge forms. We might have a different regime about um, our concessions if you're struggling for payment. We may have a different payment plan arrangement for that smaller business. So I'm thinking, yes, there there is a benefit here. If I think of the fair work space... I really like something that Kate Carnell has put on the table as the ASBFEO, the Small Business Ombudsman, um, the Fair Work Award for Small Business. So if you're 20 employees or less, here's a simpler award system, not one of the 132 other awards, but as a small business, here's one you might understand and here's one your employees might understand. What a brilliant idea. So, so great idea, simplicity around the fair work. Um, it's not a lay, lay down misere. It's not going to happen overnight. But so there is a reason, I think, to di- differentiate between the complex business structures that the large end of town have and what could be streamlined and simpler processes for the smaller end of town. So it is, an, it is something that we, we should be aiming for and that we should be advocating for is, is a, a definition. But then again, you've mentioned Fair Work, you've mentioned ATO, we mentioned legislators. Uh, are they all going to come to the table and actually give us some parameters here or is that really pie in the sky stuff? There is some good work going on uh, within government sitting down and trying to align those definitions. Um, and again, I'll, I will you know, appreciate the work that Kate Carnell's office does and her team. Um, pulling government departments in and going, here's all your definitions, guys. And I think they came up with 25 different levels of parameters to define a small business or the concession and said, let's agree on a set of words. Now, I don't think we'll get one. I don't think we'll get one parameter because some have very high turnover but very low margins Mm. and low staff. Mm. Some have um, a staff. So I think, you know, turnover could be one indicator for some reasons. Number of employees could be another parameter Mm. to determine whether you're large or small. Mm. Um, Payment times is one that is generating this discussion about a small business indicator. I'm trying to turn that conversation around to not having a small business indicator, but to have a large business identifier. It's a lot easier to identify the large businesses and go, you're a large business, you must pay according to this regime, rather than have a small business put up their hand to say, I want to be paid quicker. What's your thinking on the solution that the government has on the table at the moment, which is creating a list of large companies who are really terrible at their payment terms and then having the expectation that small business is A, going to look at the list, B, understand what the report means and C, turn down a large client because they don't pay them in a timely fashion. Do you think that's the solution or do we have to be asking more than that? I absolutely think there is credibility in giving some transparency to the behaviour of large companies in their paying cycles. So that small business that wants to engage with the large company might be a big contract. And they go and have a look at this payment times transparency register and see that they pay in 120 days. I might still sign the contract, but I have built into my thinking, 
I'm not going to get paid for 120 days. That's a good point. So I, I like the transparency. So there is absolutely some credibility to that model. What's your thought on the model of just mandate it so that everybody gets paid in 30 days? What's the consequence if you don't meet the mandate? Penalties, so, the ability to charge interest. So think of the small business that's subject to that mandate and has a downturn or has a big client go belly up and all of a sudden their cash flow is shot. So they can't meet their 30 days. So what's my consequence? Mm. Through no fault of my own, I literally have no cash. So do I go to a cash flow lender and lose 30% of my fee? My, my value in the fee, now don't get me wrong, there is a, there is a business case for cash flow lending, mm. but as an emergency or disaster recovery to avoid a penalty under a mandated payment term, it's not, it's not quite as simple. Not quite as simple. Darn it, I was hoping I'd found the solution to everyone's <laughs> problem. Now, Matthew, let's talk about um, uh, where you see the bookkeeping industry in, say, five or ten years' time. It's evolving so quickly. We have so many expectations. We're turning into advisors and not just, you know, the data entry personnel that we were perhaps five or ten or fifteen years ago. Where do you see the future of the industry heading? So you touched on a few points there and we've touched on sort of the evolving technology. We go back a few years and what did a bookkeeper do? 95% of their time was data creation. It was process the data, it was record the data, it was simply get it into a book and add it up and, and report it somehow. Where we've got to now is our technology is enabling us to create that data and record that data so much more. So our budget the allowed amount of time can be reallocated. So it's not data creation, but it might be data certainty. Is this correct? So we get to do a little bit more verification mm. work. Um, we get to um, understand it a little bit more. So let's understand the numbers. What's behind the numbers? Now let's have a discussion with the business owner or others about what's going on inside that business. So I think our world has moved from data creation and, yes, we might have got to reconcile it if the time allowed, to the data's created so much quicker. There's a more time allocated to checking that it's right. So I think we're in a far more accurate world, mm. or could be, today, far more sure that what we put on the table, the numbers we put on the form are correct. So should government come and audit us, should the ATO come, I believe we're in a world now that the bookkeeper and the businesses should have been able to spend more time checking that the numbers were right. We have better tools. We can do this. Exactly. And, and just to, as to find one final question, um, where do you see the role of big data heading? Because obviously um, we have the likes of Xero and MYOB who are kind of the bastions of all this information, which we as bookkeepers have made perfect for them and made all very perfect and compliant. Um, where do you think that role is with, um, I guess, the bridge between what we do and what policymakers are going to do with that data? Um, so I'm going to answer it two ways, but I'll probably avoid your question and not deliberately, but let's come back to your question. Uh, I'm mildly, and I'm watering that down, disappointed with how our existing software is using automated techniques. I'm hesitant to use artificial intelligence as a word, but automated techniques to analyse our data and give us anomaly reports report back to us. So in terms of, and it's, that's where the big data bit comes in. What are they doing? They've got the data, run your machine learning over it, run your analytics over it and report back to us. I'm mildly disappointed with where we're at today. I think they've got it on their table. I think they've got it in their draft code. It's not just on the whiteboard anymore, but they haven't delivered. So I'm looking for, um, automated techniques, machine learning techniques, anomaly reports, analysis reports, to help com within a business's set of data, help report back how are we going compared to previously, how are we going compared to what we thought. Then we get to the big data world as the doors open up a little bit more. And you know, the software companies like looking inside their multiple clients and coming up with industry trends. 
Well, how about at a push of a couple of buttons, we compare our business to our nearest neighbour and get some of that, I'm hesitant to use the word benchmarking because that's a term that we, we've you know, not executed particularly well. But um, I think we're going to have better computers, more connected, therefore we have access to more data we have access to more information. We just need the tools now to work out for that cafe, how are they actually performing to, to other ca cafes? Mm. So I like where the big data concept goes. We just don't have the tools or analysis in you place. You want to bring yet. it back down to the granular level so it really helps the end user. Yep. Mm, interesting. Yeah. But I do like the, the trend-type reports that come out. Um, if I pick on two, the MYB radar report, the Zero Insights reports, they're great. Huge industry trends and huge economy-wide trends mm, that they're getting yeah. so much quicker. Mm. Um, we're doing some work and concept work with the Australian Bureau of Statistics to go, you know, nobody outside the ABS actually fully appreciates really what they do and the data they've got and how to read it. Uh, and we'd love to see small business value submitting an ABS survey because we know what information we can get back out of it. That's all the big data. Mm. Um, Alexa, I'm a real fan of the better computers we have. I'm a real fan of the better connectedness we've got. And I think bookkeepers can really leverage off that because we do know the granular what's going on in the business. Now give me insights to some data how much more value can we add? Fantastic. Well, that, that really gives us a great overview of where the future of, of bookkeeping is heading. I'd like to thank you so much for joining Small Biz Matters and giving us a real understanding of the importance of the bookkeeper and the importance of associating yourself with a professional group that can give you the education, the advocacy, the the you know the power of what um, something like ICB can give you. So thank you so much for joining us this evening and um, we'll, of course, be uh, broadcasting this during National Bookkeeping Week. How can people find out as a small business how they can get in touch with a qualified ICB member? So in the ICB case, on the ICB website, find a bookkeeper and have a search for our members in practice who have met certain requirements in order to be listed there. Fantastic. Thank you so much for joining Small Biz Matters. I'm Alexi Boyd and we'll be back next week with another excellent business education piece. Thanks again, Matthew. Thanks, Alexi.